Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So I chose that portion of the small catechism because many weeks ago when I was, well, actually months now, when I was kind of scheduling them out, I thought I was going to preach on the first Timothy text on, on the requirements or the, the qualifications for pastors and deacons. Um, however, I did not prepare a sermon on that text. And all weekend long, it keeps changing in my mind. And, uh, and I want us to start actually tonight, or today, looking at uh, the Old Testament reading from Amos. It's an interesting text. We kind of come into it and we hear these woes spoken against the people. Because they have negated their covenant with God. They have rejected their God by, by living in a manner of selfishness. They, they will claim the name of God. They will look to their God as, as their God. But they won't listen to him. They will not allow his word to shape their lives. And so the manner in which they live, it seems just ordinary, right? So they have nice beds. So they lay down on the couch and watch the football game on Sunday afternoon. You know, they like lamb, even if some of you don't. They just do those normal, everyday things that everybody does. But that is their only concern. They are only concerned about their belly. They're only concerned about their IRA. Their only concern is for their household and for the needs of themselves and as it is written there that they have no concern for Joseph they have no concern for their neighbor they do not look outside their window and see the one who is in need and so we begin to see here the connection then to the gospel reading in the parable that Jesus tells of Lazarus and the rich man Amos was sent to the people to, to proclaim to them a judgment based upon this behavior. Because their behavior belies an unfaith. It tells of an unfaith. It shows that they truly do not trust in God. And the judgment that comes upon them is an exile. Here, an, an Assyrian conquer, um, um, conquest as they are hauled off, and, and as we were talking in the, the Bible class today, those northern ten tribes, the nation known as Israel, just ceases to be. It is no more. Even though they were the first of the nations, the ones chosen by God to bear the gospel into the world. And the way that they would do that is by listening to and living according to God's word. And then they would be that beacon to the world. So Jesus here is confronting the rich people of Israel, the Pharisees, those that, that pretend to be people of God, think that they are the, 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 the righteous of God. But they have no heart for God and, and for the ways of God. And so he tells this parable of a rich man, right? A man who's living his best life now. He's a successful executive. He's, he's got that nice home that's on the edge of town up on the hill. And, you know, coming just shortly after the, the prodigal son, he's the kind of guy here, though, that kills that fattened calf every day. He's got enough of them. That he's not worried about, is it hamburger or... Filet today. It's always filet. But he's just like the people that Amos was speaking to in the Old Testament. He was thinking about himself. Even though God put in his path an opportunity. Put in his path a means by which he could be generous. A way in which he could show that that word of God dwelled in him richly. He 
put Lazarus at his doorstep. Lazarus, a man that could do nothing for himself. It even says that he was laying there, right? He, somebody had to bring him out each day and put him there. A man who was completely at the mercy of God and his neighbor. A man that was so downtrodden that even the dogs showed mercy on him, right? It says they, that they licked his wounds. Nobody nursed him other than but the rich man. Instead of going out the front door, I guess he always used the side door, right? He, he never came, conf confronted Lazarus, never stepped up to him and offered him any help. And you know, I guess the challenge as we look at it would be that is that why he went to hell? Because he never did any good things. And Lazarus, is that why he went to the, to the, the bosom of Abraham, that, that he ended up in heaven? Because, you know, he was just poor? It's much more than that. So I want you to think back. I know I always tell you, think back to last week, right? Because it is a follow-on. Our readings come right after the readings of last week. And I had mentioned those, those couple of verses from the Athanasian Creed that we can confess, where it says that those who have done good shall be rewarded with righteousness, a place in heaven. Those who have done evil, right, will be punished. And it's a difficult thing because it sure sounds like works righteousness taken out of context, taken all by itself. And the parable might seem the same way, taken all by itself. But what Jesus is saying is that this rich man acts out of his character. He acts in a way because of what his heart or the condition of his heart says. It doesn't say a whole lot about Lazarus, but his name speaks for him. One whom depends upon the mercy of God. Lazarus lived by God's mercy. The rich man had no mercy. I was talking with, uh, so I'm gonna, not going to use last names, but... Um, Paul and Naomi, obviously, right? And so visiting Naomi this week, and Paul and I stepped out in the hall and we're talking a little bit. And um, Naomi, he said, has been sermon, sermoning people. I think that's how he put it, right? Because she's getting a lot of visitors at the end of her life. And um, when they come, she is making sure that she sermons them. She gives them the gospel because she's got a friend or two i guess that just kind of hold on to things they can't forgive and so paul and i were talking about it out there and it relates very much because equate forgiveness with mercy here and um the the idea comes that one who does not understand god's mercy one who I'm going to put a fall in or something. Normally it doesn't do that. Um, one who does not understand God's mercy, one who has not received that mercy as Lazarus receives it, humble and without any pretense, does not know what it means to receive mercy and cannot in turn be merciful. The rich man is not merciful because he doesn't believe that he needs mercy. The rich man cannot offer anything to Lazarus because he doesn't see that he needs anything from God. He's got it all already. And so he lives out of the character or he displays the character of his heart. One who is hard, one whose heart is callous and dead. Instead of one who has received the mercy of God, the one who can look upon the cross and see the dire need of himself in his own sinfulness and can
call upon the name of the Lord for forgiveness. And in turn, be as merciful to others. When I, when I teach confirmation, there's a couple of verses that I try to make sure every student learns from Ephesians, and you probably know these, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. They speak wonderful gospel, right? And I'll just read it. Yes, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Wonderful gospel, free gift from God. The forgiveness of our sins comes to us solely because of what Christ has done for us in his living and in his dying and in his rising again. But then there is another verse that comes after those two in verse 10. And Paul goes on to write there, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared before him, that we should walk in them. Lazarus was put in the path of God, in the path of the rich man by God, so that the rich man could be of service to his neighbor, to demonstrate his faith, to be a witness then even for others. God puts people in your path. I'll say daily. And gives us then the same opportunity to show the mercy that we have received. To be a witness, maybe to the individual, to others around. To do those good works that have been prepared for us from the foundation of the world. And um, I'm going to read a short portion from our hymn today. Um, Kind of like the second sentence, second phrase of the second stanza. Lord, grant that I in every place may glorify thy lavish grace. And enter my name. The hymn, the hymn Schalling here, um, a Reformation era hymn writer, writes this, this stanza understanding that the work that we do is a direct reflection upon the grace that we have received from God. So, for those that those Lazaruses that God has put before you in life, I pray that by His Spirit He strengthens you, gives to you the ability, grants to you the faith, subdues all of your um, passions such that, that you are able to, to serve God above all things and serve your neighbor even as you would yourself. In the name of Jesus. Amen.